Hello everybody and welcome to another video uh, aimed at our coursework on anti-semitism in Germany. So in this video I'm going to look at anti-semitism in German society concentrating on media, literature and violence. In previous video I've looked at the manifestation of anti-semitism through government action but this won't tell us the whole story. So Whilst government will tell us a bit about attitudes in Germany at any given moment in time, it won't give us the full story because as we've spoken about in previous videos, the German government in their various different forms through this period of time, going through from 1815 through to 1945, don't necessarily reflect the views of the people and they will all reflect it to differing degrees. So whilst Weimar is democratic, the Kaiser, Kaiser's Germany is a, an autocratic state, though there would have to be some consideration of public opinion. The, um, the state before that, is, well, it's just different. There are multiple states in multiple different forms. So before unification, it is even more difficult. So in this, this video, we're going to look at the manifestation of anti-Semitism amongst the German people during the period. So some of this would might be looking at press and literature or other forms of media as we, as we develop uh, further through time, such as uh, film, for example, in the Nazi period. And the other bit we're going to look at is violence. So the one way to which the Nazi period is obviously going to be an anomaly is going to be in terms of violence, because there is nothing in German history, in fact, that there's basically just not really much in history that that, that would mean that the the were the Holocaust was anything other than an, other than anomaly in terms of the scale and the horrendous nature of the violence. So, what we're looking for, however, if we're going to judge it not to be an anomaly in terms of the Nazi period and the German people's attitudes during the Nazi period to not be an anomaly, we're going to need to be looking at other things and other elements to, to suggest that. The, the these ideas were already entrenched, that people were already acting on them, uh, and maybe some other explanation in terms of what was happening. Now, in the Nazi period, the gap between actions of government and the actions of the people is going to be really blurred, because whilst in previous periods we will see free press and free, and free publication, obviously in the Nazi period they controlled all of the media. And then whilst we might see some spontaneous violence in earlier periods, such as Hep Hep, in the Nazi period, the violence is orchestrated, is ordered by the Nazi government. And this then leads to a lot of historical debates surrounding responsibility and whether the German people acted willingly or through fear. In future videos will examine two key historians, Christopher Browning and Daniel Goldhagen. Now, they have very, very differing views on this, and this will set up a key cornerstone of your coursework where you'll look at these two historians and you'll look at their interpretation. Now, whilst Browning is going to argue that those who carried out the killings did so because people in authority told them to do it and they were scared and that they um, felt a degree of peer pressure, Goldhagen's going to argue that they did it willingly and would have done it without um, the fear of the regime. And in fact, they would have done it earlier if there had been different regimes in place. So Goldhagen's view is particularly controversial, um, but all of this feeds into the idea of anomaly. Because if, if Goldhagen is right, there is no anomaly uh, and the German people's beliefs were the same going through the whole of our period really. And that the, the the Nazis just enabled the, the German people to enact it. And obviously that puts huge responsibility on the German people as a whole for the Holocaust. If Browning is right, then actually the, the, the actions of the German people in the Nazi period is an enormous anomaly because they are only acting in that way because they are being made to do so by the Nazis. But in maybe a, a different way, you could argue that even under, under Browning, it's not an anomaly because the, the German people didn't want to act in a, an anti-Semitic way beforehand. And they continued to not want to act in an anti-Semitic way uh, during the Holocaust, but were made to do so by the Nazis. So we've got some different arguments we'll be looking at. Right. So interpreting this evidence, and I'm going to go through uh, various parts. I'm actually going to I'll go into more detail on the pre-Weimar and definitely all the pre-Nazi stuff, because the, the Nazi era is going to be the bit where you're going to find it easiest to find uh, that detail, uh, while some of the other stuff is maybe a little bit more obscure. Now, you will be able to find publications of anti-Semitic material going through the whole time period. 
However, the key to your arguments will be finding evidence of how well widely it was consumed and how people reacted to it. So the existence of anti-Semitic material within society at any given moment of time is not going to by itself going to tell you whether the German people were anti-Semitic or not. And there's other things that we'll be looking, you, looking at as well. So, for example, it might be that the message is not an anomaly, but the reaction is. Um, so are the Nazi ideas original ideas or do they, they link back to ideas that had been stated by other people over the previous 50, 100, 130 years? Now, it might be that you decide that the, what the Nazis say actually comes directly or links directly back to 19th century writers. But what's different is the volume of the propaganda that they produced and the, the size of the audience it received compared to the much smaller groups of people who were reading it and consuming it back in the 19th century. Right. Violence is infrequent until the Nazi era. Now, does that prove that it only happens due to Nazi orders or, or do previous do previous governments prevent anti-Semitic violence that would have happened? When violence takes place under the Nazis, do the German people do this willingly to fulfill some kind of long long term desire? And Goldhagen will argue that is the case or because they've been brainwashed by Nazi propaganda or because they simply because those in authority told them to do it, which is what Browning would argue. Now, all of those are things that you need to consider and um, and make your own mind up on. Right. So we're going to look at some of the details of some of the stuff that happened. Now, the starting point, and this is often uh, one that students uh, look into in a bit of detail, is the Hep Hep riots in 1819. Now, this shows us that there was definitively at this point in time anti-Semitic feeling because we see Jewish people being attacked by their German neighbours. It starts in Würzburg in Bavaria. Uh, uh, stirred up at a local university and then it spreads from there. Now the, the context of this is is the um, demands for emancipation at the Congress of Vienna, uh, huge economic problems with the Great Famine of 1816 to 17, the ending of the Napoleonic Wars and, and Jewish freedom was associated uh, with the uh, Napoleon's regimes and therefore uh, not particularly popular in, in the areas of Germany, which are now being freed from uh, previous control by Napoleon's empire. Now, the economic crises tend to lead to anti-Semitism because of one form of anti-Semitism connects Jewish people with uh, banking and money lending. Uh, and so it might well have been linked to that. However, the wealthy Jewish population in Germany tended to live in Prussia, uh, most uh, notably um, in places like Berlin. And, and the, the violence wasn't there. It was over in Bavaria. And in Bavaria, most of the Jewish population was really rather poor. Um, the, the, the name Hep Hep Riots comes from um, what the people were shouting as they were carrying out the rioting. And they're shouting apparently, Hep Hep, Jerusalem is lost. And so this violence swept through multiple towns and villages, says so it's not just concentrated in one particular place and outer regions of the German Confederation, but not through the whole of Germany. Um, troops were called in and in towns when the, the uh, militia arrived promptly, they stopped the rioting. Um, this wasn't a case of it just being the lower classes. It was actually quite a lot of well-educated people who were involved in this, uh, including even some university professors. Uh, and there were other people who were bystanders. And the concept of bystander is really important in Holocaust history um, because you've got to not only look at those who perpetrate, so those who carry out atrocities, but you also got to look at the reactions of those around them and whether they do anything to stop it. And after this period, anti-Semitic publication became more common in the German press. So there is definitively something here. Now, it is nothing like the scale of anything we'll see in Nazi Germany. But there was anti-Semitic belief, anti-Semitic action in society. Now, you could argue it's limited to where that happens in Germany, but it does definitely happen. In pre-unification Germany, we see some um, publications. Um, so Dolores Passion of Our Jesus Christ, according to the meditations of Anne Catherine Emmerich. I mean, a nice catchy title. Um, it's by uh, Clemens Brenito, uh, uh, Bren Brentona. I, I'm sure I've said that wrong. Apologies. Um, it, it's clear here that, that there is anti-Semitic thought. There's a lot, very anti-Semitic strain in this book. So 
linked in a lot with religious anti-Semitism. But it does put things that we'll see prop up and, and believe by the Nazis and those, their supporters, things like the, the idea of the blood libel about the um, ceremonies involving uh, the blood of uh, Christian children being used. It's all nonsense, but it does show that that thread of anti-Semitism existed at this point in time. Richard Wagner, a very famous composer, um, wrote a, an essay attacking um, Jews in music, um, concentrating particularly on a couple of Jewish composers. Um, and in this, he argued that the Jews had nothing to contribute to music. So Wagner is, goes on, he's Hitler's favourite composer. They used a lot of his music in the, the Nazis. But the actual readership at the time, we reckon, was probably about 2,000 people. And it was criticised by many who read it. So it existed, but the scale of it is... Um, is maybe limited. Arthur de Gobineau um, was a French writer and he wrote um, an essay on the inequality of the human races. And this is early stage of racial theory in 1855 and that gets translated into German and, and those ideas start to spread. So again they existed. How widespread these ideas were is less clear. So under the Kaiser, well do, do we see violence? Well not really. Um, now there is arguments in this. Now, do they not happen because the, the Kaiser was an autocrat, the head of a militaristic state, and this state does not tolerate any kind of public disorder? So do people not attack the Jews, not because they don't want to, but because they feel that the state would stop them from doing it? I, I, I think there's a lot of problems with that argument, but it is one that can be made. We also see in this period, we, we see a lot of Eastern Jews who are escaping from violence in Tsarist Russia under uh, pogroms, which were horrendous attacks on Jewish populations, which were taking place and were encouraged by Alexander III and Nicholas II, the two, two last two Tsars of Russia. Now, these Eastern Jews tended to receive um, less welcome in Germany than the more assimilated Western Jews who had been there for a long time. But the fact that Germany is seen as a safe haven where you escape from violence and persecution tells us quite a lot. There was um, a degree of anti-Semitic feeling sparked again by another economic disaster at the economic crash of 1873. Right. Now, one thing we definitively do see in the, uh, the Kaiser era is we do see lots of anti-Semitic writing. Um, Wilhelm uh, Marft, seen as the father of anti-Semitism, um, wrote his book The Victory of the Jews Over the Germans in 1879. And this is really the first kind of big anti-Semitic bestseller, uh, which is a horrible thing to think about. But it, this did happen. And there's a picture of Marr at the top there. So in your research, that is definitely something to look at. So how widespread was the reading of Wilhelm Marr? How, how big? Were the, was the number of people who were accepting his ideas. Another 19th century writer is often, um, well, was used by the Nazis is Friedrich Nietzsche, who was a philosopher. Um, now, the Nazis have to be very selective when they use him because he did actually say in some of his writing that the Jews were the strongest, toughest and purest race now living in Europe, which kind of contrasts everything the Nazis said in their racial theory. But there were bits that he talked about with um, Ubermen and Untermenschen and that the, the, the Nazis did use and, and twist. Henrik von Trust um, is a again another important writer. He published a series of articles in, in, about the negative role of Jews in Germany. Adolf Stoker was a chaplain to the Kaiser's court and obviously in, he delivered lots of anti-Semitic um, messages as well. A really important writer right at the end of the period uh, is Houston Stuart Chamberlain, who wrote The Foundations of the 19th Century. He's actually Wagner's son-in-law, uh, and his racial theory, um, he saw history as a struggle between the white race and other races, and, and essentially everything that was wrong in the world, he blamed on the Jews. He was Hitler's favourite writer, and Hitler described meeting him as a really proud day. So we can trace Nazi ideas back to this, but... Is there a difference in terms of how well widely these have been consumed and how they are being reacted to? So Hitler read it and liked it, but is that does that make him unusual? Does that it was that a common reaction to it in Germany? Right. If we go into the Weimar period, we again the violence we see is very limited. So we see a couple of of um, really key events that, that are worth maybe a little bit of a look at in terms of 
the, the political murders. So Rosa Luxemburg um, was a, 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 a Jewish uh, political figure. She was a Spartacist. She was a revolutionary communist, uh, important writer, actually, in, in the history of socialism. And she was murdered by the Freikorps, a right wing group who were um, kind of <clears throat> employed as a paramilitary group to, to protect uh, the state from Marxist revolution. And she was seen in Germany as a kind of a symbol of the link between Jews and communism, which, again, was another made up thing uh, by anti-Semites. Um, the uh, another famous Jewish politician was Walter Rathenau, who was a politician, a businessman. His family owned AEG, which is a company who still runs today. He was foreign minister in 1922. He signed the Treaty of Appello with communist uh, Russia. And, it, and after, uh, after doing that, he was killed by right wing nationalists. Uh, and there was a series. He was seen as a seen as a royal profiteer. As he was seen as having um, having accepted the uh, the Treaty of Versailles. He was um, criticised for making a treaty uh, with Russia. Um, th there were rumours he was he was homosexual. So there was lots of reasons why the right wing might dislike him. However, it doesn't mean the German people disliked him. Uh, and what we can see is is why we get this real different perception. It is said that up to millions of people lined the streets for his funeral as a mark of respect, whilst Hitler later made his, the day of his murder a national holiday. So it's worth remembering that it took an awful lot more people to elect Walter Rathenau. There was an awful lot more people who gave an outpouring of sympathy uh, following his death than there were the small group of people who plotted to kill him and then the, uh, the Nazis who celebrated it. So if we also look at the Weimar period and we look at terms of press and literature, now we've, we've got a couple of, of really important bits in this. Now, Weimar Germany has almost no censorship. It's an incredibly open and free society. So you will find really extreme things being published, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they are widely supported. So we see things like the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. It's actually written in the Kaiser period. It's a Russian forgery, but it it continued to be uh, widely um, spread and read and cited after World War One. It's, it's crazy conspiracy theory. It's utter nonsense, but it did have quite a profound effect. General Ludendorff at the end of the war blamed it all on the November criminals and the stab in the back. And this is something that the Nazis really made a big deal out of. And it was widely reported in the German press and, and given um, quite a lot of coverage. Hitler wrote Mein Kampf in 1925, but barely anybody read it. Um, but again, as you they look, look at and I did a good way of getting a hold of anomaly here. Look at the number of people buying it in 1925 through 1928 and look at the number of people who were buying it after 1933. And, and obviously you're going to get a massive transformation. Now, is that a transformation in the mindset of the German people, or is that because you had to own one because you're in the Nazi state? The most extreme um, publication was Der Strömer, uh, edited by Julius Streicher, who was vile in his anti-Semitism. It was so extreme and basically pornographic. Um, even lots of Nazis considered it uh, to be uh, too much. Um, Goering famously uh, wouldn't have it in any of his uh, offices, even though theoretically by law it had to be in all businesses. There was a couple of financial crises, uh, so a couple of financial scandals um, involving Jewish people. There's the Barmat scandal uh, and the, 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 a scandal around the Scarlet Brothers. And again, the press then socialised this to, to highlight this idea of uh, Jewish uh, uh, corrupt, financial corruption, which again was another uh, old form of anti-Semitism. Now, the stuff existed, but that's not the whole story. Now, if we go alongside this, remember we're in a free society at this point in time. Um, the the Jewish population was less than one percent of the German population. However, they made up eleven percent of the doctors, sixteen percent of the lawyers, uh, and both statistics on that were much much higher inside um, Berlin. Um, Fifty percent of uh, private banks were, Ju were Jewish owned. Eighty percent of department stores were Jewish owned. There were key Jewish figures, not only in areas such as science and a lot of the Nobel Prize winners from Germany at this point were, were Jewish, but also in uh, in the arts and the media. So uh, uh, Max uh, Reinhardt was a theatre director. Kurt Veil uh, was a, a musician and songwriter. 
uh, wrote lots of really famous bits of music. Uh, Fritz Lang was a, a, a really well-known filmmaker. Uh, uh, Mendel uh, Mendelssohn was a uh, an architect. Uh, Theodore Wolff was a really uh, renowned journalist and author. Two major newspapers, the Berlin uh, Tageblatt and the Frankfurt Zeitung, were both Jewish owned. So this is then going to be an enormous leap when you go into Nazi Germany, because the German people obviously during this period are not being forced to employ a Jewish doctor or a Jewish lawyer or to go and um, watch a, a, a Jewish uh, songwriter or a Jewish made film or a, Jew, a, a theatre production with a Jewish director or read a, a Jewish owned a newspaper or an article by a Jewish um, journalist. So this kind of stuff would really suggest a lack of anti-Semitism amongst a large part of the German population. So. When the Nazis are in power, we, we see a vast amount of, uh, of anti-Semitic propaganda. Obviously, in your essay, you're not going to be able to cover all of it. And it takes many, many different forms. So we see uh, newspapers such as Der Suma, which is the most extreme. We see um, anti-Semitic uh, things on radio. We see children's books such as The Poisonous Mushroom. Uh, in education, we see race science being, um, it's not a real science, uh, being taught in schools and at universities. Eugenics was taught at universities as well, which is um, more, even more nonsense. Um, and we we see uh, race theory being imposed through youth groups such as the Hitler Youth. We see anti-Semitism in posters. We see it in films. Um, uh, and even there was an, even an exhibition called The Eternal Jew, which travelled round. Germany and um, thousands and thousands of people went to see. So if you see in my book, the, there's detail all this different type of propaganda, pages 69 through to 73. The key figure, the propaganda minister, was Joseph Goebbels. So he's a really important figure in promoting all of this. Um, now, it's hard deciding how much of a, an impact all this had. Now, it would appear that young people uh, were most affected. Uh, and then we get some really odd arguments. Goldhagen argues that the German people didn't need convincing at all. So why then would the Nazis spend so much time and effort on doing it? Um, there were three anti-Semitic uh, films in, in 1941 alone. There was the, uh, the Rothschilds, Jude Seuss, which was a kind of historical based drama. And there was The Eternal Jew, which was a, a horrendous uh, documentary, which essentially filmed Jewish people living in the in the Polish ghettos and insinuated that they were like rats. It, it well, not very subtly. It is horrible. So a lot of the most extreme stuff just turned people off and made people just laughed at it. Their stream, they laughed at the Eternal Jew film, they laughed at it and went, it's not, just not real. Things that there were the high production value, like the, the with the story behind it, with a, a Jewish villain like uh, Jude Seuss, had a bigger impact and, and was more positively um, responded to. All this to me suggests, and again, this is for you to make your own mind, seems to suggest that the German people took took a lot of convincing or the Nazis believed they needed a lot of convincing. And, and even in 41, they weren't they weren't sure they had convinced them. Right. The next bit, there is there's just too much of it for me to go through all of it and, and to, to do any kind of justice. You do need to do your research. You do need to look at it. It is upsetting. It is horrible. Um, but it is what happened and we need to learn from these things. The, the, in, when it comes to violence, there is significant difference between violence by the Nazis during peacetime and during war. Uh, there is significant difference between what happens in Germany and what happens in the East. Um, so even a lot, the, the vast majority of the German Jews who are killed are not killed inside Germany. They are killed in death camps in places like Poland, mainly in Poland. The, the Jews in Poland and Russia and other places that are taken over, uh, Latvia, Lithuania, all these, they are treated very, very much differently to the German Jews. We see some uncontrolled SA violence in 1933, anti-Semitic violence at that point. The next big one we see is Kristallnacht, this explosion of, um, of violence in 1938. Uh, we see Jew Jewish shops destroyed, synagogues set ablaze, uh, and reports of around 100, 90 to 100 Jewish people killed, and then we have massive Jewish arrests after this, and Jews are made to pay for the cleanup. 
and that really is one of the signs of, the, of this massive escalation. In places like Poland, the Jewish population herded into ghettos. In Poland and then in, in Soviet Russia, the, there are the Einsatzgruppen, which are killing squads where that are shooting Jewish men, women, and children. And the death the death numbers are horrendous. About one and a half million, uh, by estimations, are shot by the Einsatzgruppen and the and the uh, the police battalions that are assigned to them. Browning's book is about Battalion 101, which was a, a group of conscripted um, police reservists who were part of one of these, uh, part of a killing squad. The major part of the, the Holocaust then takes place in these horrendous death camps, places like Sorbibor and Treblinka and then Auschwitz, which are essentially factories of death. They are designed to kill large numbers of people. Uh, and the, the figures are, of Jewish deaths are around six million. And the conditions in these places are horrendous. The whole procedure is incredibly cynical and calculated. Uh, and there's a complete lack of any form of humanity in it all. Um, it is difficult to find the, the <laughs> Well, the stuff from before to, to see this, this in any way other than anomaly. But places, play, people like Goldhagen argue that it, it's not and that it comes out of the earlier stages of history. So there is a debate here and that's something you need to look at. And it feeds into a lot of the debates surrounding uh, the Holocaust itself. And they, these feed into the argument we're looking about. So how much did the German people know about the Holocaust? And remember that it's not most of these killings are taking place outside Germany and are not of German people. Uh, the, the, uh, the Jewish population in Germany in 1939 is probably somewhere around a quarter of a million. Uh, so as you can see from the numbers, the vast, vast majority of Jews that are killed by the Nazis are not German. Uh, if they didn't, if they knew about it, and that is debate, but if they knew about it, did they support it or did they just not do anything because they were scared? To what extent are they responsible for what happened in terms of what, to what extent are the German people are responsible? Now, there's a whole lot of stuff on responsibility in Chapter 10 of my book. In particular, look at the case studies on 136137. The first one of these, now, the, the first of these points next is, is one of those that's always stuck, uh, struck, struck me and stayed with me is, is the story of, uh, there's a camp called Belsen, which was in Germany, was in a death camp, but there uh, didn't stop thousands and thousands of people dying there from disease and starvation. It's one of the few camps that was um, was liberated by the British. And one thing the British command did is they went and they took the important figures from the, the local area and they took and they showed them what their government had done. And they showed them the, the suffering and the starvation and the disease and the death that the, their government were responsible for. And one couple that were taken around were the mayor and his wife from a, a, a nearby a place called Cell. And they were so horrified by what they saw that they, when they got home, they hanged themselves. And so they were so ashamed by what they had seen their country doing. Now, this, was, this is someone in an official position who lives really close to one of the concentration camps in Germany. And according to this account, knew nothing about what was going on. There's another story. This isn't one in the book. This is this is from an, a Nazis warning from history, which is really is, is a book and, it, and is a, also a documentary series. And it's from a, an episode called The Road to the Blinker, which is well worth you watching. And in it, there's a, um, a, a an interview with a guy who's a, a phone operator and he overhears Martin Bormann, who's um, kind of uh, right hand man, really, of, of Hitler, yelling at Heinrich Himmler, who was the head of the SS, because Himmler has given latest numbers on numbers killed by the Einsatz group and then in, rather than saying evacuated he stumbles over and he says exterminated and Bormann goes kind of mad at him down the phone saying this is, you, this is an open line you cannot be discussing this we cannot essentially have this news getting out. Now there wouldn't be that de degree of anger you would suggest if, if it was widely known and widely accepted. Right much longer video than I would normally do. Um, thank you very much for watching. I'm sure this should prove to be really, really helpful um, in your course, but you might need to watch it in chunks. Um, please remember to like, to share. If you haven't already, please subscribe. 
I will continue going through some coursework stuff. There's now a good bulk of, of what you should need to get you going. Uh, any questions or anything, uh, drop us a comment. Right. Thank you very much for watching. I'll speak to you all again soon.